Hey folks, how's everybody doing out there? In the last installment of our History of Software and Three-Letter Acronyms, I talked about the British Broadcasting Corporation, their computer literacy project, and how a British microcomputer from the early 1980s would turn out to play an instrumental role in the creation of the most successful processor architecture in history. This week, we move on to C, and C is for Control, Program, and Monitor. Or maybe the control program for microcomputers? It kind of doesn't matter, because everyone who remembers it just remembers it as CPM. CPM dates back to 1974, and it was created by this guy, Gary Kildall. Gary was teaching computer science at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California, around the time that a company called Intel announced their first ever microprocessor chip. Kildall used the school's IBM mainframe to create a simulator of the new Intel chip. Word of his exploits got around, and 1973, Intel hired him to develop a programming language for microcomputers, which they called PLM, which stood for Programming Language for Microcomputers. Yeah, this was the early days of the information age. Naming things was easier because you didn't have to worry about whether the dot-com domain was still available. Early 1974, Kildall starts working on tools for the second generation of Intel processors. He'd got hold of one of the new 8-inch floppy disk drives, but he didn't have any way of actually transferring data to or from it, so he wrote what today we'd call an operating system. Now, it wasn't much of an operating system, really, it was just enough code for the CPU to talk to the disk drive, but it was quite possibly the first time anybody had ever booted a microcomputer from a floppy disk. He called his new program CPM, the Control Program and Monitor, and Intel weren't interested. So in 1976, Gary Kildall and his wife Dorothy set up a company, Intergalactic Digital Research, to commercialize his new software. They dropped the intergalactic bit pretty quickly, becoming just plain digital research. By 1978, CPM was the market-leading microcomputer operating system, mainly thanks to another one of Kildall's innovations, the BIOS, Basic Input-Output System, an abstraction layer that provided a standard interface to hardware like disk drives, keyboards, and displays. If you built your own computer and you wanted it to run CPM, all you had to do was to create a compatible BIOS for your machine. And that's exactly what most of the early microcomputer companies did. Altair, Amstrad, Osborne, even the BBC Micro could run CPM. Now, my first computer was one of these, an Amstrad CPC 6128, and it ran CPM. A few years ago, I fired up an Amstrad emulator to create the intro graphics for a talk that I did called The Art of Code. So if any of you folks have seen that talk, the full version with the, the opening video, that's Digital Research logo running on CPM+, Plus, running on an Amstrad CPC, an emulator called Arnold. I'll put a link in the description to the full intro video if you want to watch it in all of its 8-bit green screen glory. By the early 1980s, the team at Digital Research had created a version of CPM for Intel's new 8086 processor. And this is about the point in history that the mighty IBM Corporation realizes that they have a problem. We'll talk a lot more about IBM when we get to I, but as far as the fate of CPM is concerned, what matters is that IBM has realized these new microcomputers represent an existential threat to their business model. Companies aren't going to spend $100,000 on a mainframe computer that fills a room if they can spend $1,000 on a microcomputer that'll fit on a desk. And so obviously, the solution is for IBM to build a microcomputer, a personal computer, if you like, the IBM PC. Except there's no way IBM can build a microcomputer. They're too big. The IBM way would be to design the whole thing from scratch to own the entire manufacturing pipeline, and they don't have time for that. And besides, the computer dealers are far more comfortable selling something built out of standard parts so they can do their own repairs on site and having to send, having to send machines away so they could be fixed. So IBM built the PC from off-the-shelf parts. The Intel 8088 CPU, which was a slightly slower, cheaper variant of the 8086, 16K of generic memory chips, they reused an existing IBM monitor design, the printer was outsourced to Epson, and the operating system is obviously CPM86. Obviously, it was the market leader. There were thousands of software applications available for CPM. Absolutely no question that the IBM PC would ship with Digital Research's flagship operating system. Except that's not how it happened. 
Tune in next week when D is for DOS, the disk operating system that would change the balance of power in the microcomputer industry forever. But before I sign off, I know some of you folks out there are going, no, C isn't for CPM. So let's have a bit of a shout out to the other contenders. CSS, Cascading Style Sheets, we're going to talk about later when we get to W and the World Wide Web. CGA, the color graphics array chip used in the IBM PC. That one definitely gets a mention here because I'm pretty sure that the entire neon pink and blue palette that's used in all of my favorite synthwave art comes straight out of the CGA color scheme. CD-ROM, yeah, it was kind of a big deal for a while. Shout out to everyone out there who grew up with Microsoft Encarta. But it's also an interesting example of a mashup, because CD, that's an initialism, compact disk, and ROM is an acronym for read-only memory. So it's not could ROM or CD-ROM, CD-ROM. CGI, the common gateway interface, We'll get to that in a future series about the history of the web. Or if CGI is computer-generated imagery in your part of the internet, I got a whole series coming up next year about how to build a ray tracer in JavaScript, and I'd hate to give away the ending. The common business-oriented language, the common object request broker architecture, and the component object model, COBOL, CORBA, and COM. We'll get to COBOL when we talk about Y2K, but if you want to learn about CORBA and COM, folks, I'm afraid you're on your own. And of course, C could just be C, the C programming language, which is called C because it comes after B, which was a stripped down version of BCPL, the basic combined programming language, which just so we're clear, has nothing to do with basic, which is in turn a wonderful example of something called a backronym. The language was called basic because it's designed to be basic. And the expansion, beginner's all purpose symbolic instruction code, that was bolted on afterwards. But honestly, the place that the letter C crops up most often in my day-to-day -day computing is also thanks to CPM. One of the fun things about looking back on the history of tech is noticing the uh, completely arbitrary decisions that would end up influencing systems for literally decades. Stuff where there wasn't a right or wrong answer, just a bunch of different ways to solve the same problem, and somebody picked one and got on with their day. At some point along the way, Gary Kildall and the CPM team, they needed a way to identify files stored on a specific disk drive. Now, Unix had already been around for a decade or so, and Unix solved this problem by mounting file systems as if they were directories. In fact, if any of you's ever wondered why Unix has a slash bin and a slash user slash bin, it's because Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie ran out of disk space on the PDP-11 machine they were using to create Unix, and so they mounted another disk at slash user to give them more space, and then they had to introduce conventions, like don't put the mount command on the user volume, otherwise you won't be able to mount the user volume. Now, mounting disks as directories in CPN, that was never going to work for the fairly simple reason that CPM's file system didn't have any directories. So they figured, okay, we'll use letters. That's drive A, that's drive B, and so on. And this would become one of many CPM features that was, uh, let's say, borrowed by the design of MS-DOS. And when hard drives got cheap enough to put in home computers in the late 1980s, drive A and B, they were already assigned to your two floppy disk drives. And so the hard drive became drive C. And here I am, four decades later, I got Windows running from drive C, all my source code is on drive D, and I still occasionally wonder what would happen if I plugged more than 26 physical disks into the same computer. Folks, thanks for tuning in. I hope you found that interesting. You all have a good week out there. Take it easy, look after each other, and I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.